Hello, everyone, and welcome. I'm Johanna Lyman, Board President for Conscious Capitalism of the Bay Area. And tonight we are gathering to talk about the soul of business, um, the difference and similarities between compassionate capitalism and conscious capitalism. Our guests this evening are Blaine Bartlett and Tom Henry, and I'll give a little bio for each of them now. Blaine is the president and CEO of Avatar Resources, Inc., a consulting firm he founded in 1987. The firm has affiliate offices in four countries. He served clients in Europe, Asia, Australia, Africa, and the United States. While living in Japan in the early 80s, he managed the business and international consulting division of one of the largest and most successful human resources development and consulting organizations in Asia. He's also founder of the Institute for Compassionate Capitalism, a managing director of the Global Coaching Alliance, an adjunct professor at China's Beijing University, Dean of Education at the World Business Academy, and a member of the teaching faculty at the American Association for Phys Physician Leadership. So she's in his spare time between midnight and six. In addition to his professional responsibilities, he's an avid fly fisherman and a hopelessly optimistic golfer whose handicap is that he plays the game. <laughs> Considered a major innovative voice in the area of areas of leadership development, organizational development, and change management, Blaine has been a guest lecturer on enterprise leadership development at China's prestigious Tsinghua University, I probably should have asked you how to pronounce that, uh, a featured speaker at numerous world congresses of the Junior Chamber International, a featured speaker at the World Congress for Human Resource Management, and was a core panel member of the World Consortium for Research and Development of Training. Welcome, Blaine. We're so glad you're here. Diana, thank you very much. I would have given you a much shorter bio if I'd known you were going to read the whole thing. <laughs> My oh, that's okay. No worries. Um, also joining us today is Tom Henry, who is uh, CCBA's membership chair. For 30 years, Tom has been working in the retail industry, gaining proficiency in operations, management, consumer experience, product supply, talent development, and change management. His career spans four decades in department stores and grocery. Working in leadership and executive development, he has led teams and organizations through mergers, acquisitions, bankruptcies, natural disasters, economic collapses, and recovery. Achieving all-star status at two Fortune 100 companies, Tom continues to champion for conscious capitalism and talent development. As diversity and inclusion champion, he attended both historically black and white universities in the United States in the Southern US. He served internationally as a DNI consultant and business leader. And additionally, he advocates for minority groups and family recovery organizations in his local and global communities. His academic background includes liberal arts and organization development degrees with a focus on education. He's also a Barrett certified consultant and values-based leadership coach. Uh, he's currently studying integral development and recovery, supporting his ongoing goals towards servant leadership in our interdependent global community. Tom is currently a learning and development senior team leader at Whole Foods Market. There he designs, develops, and implements conscious leadership and talent development based on the four tenets of conscious capitalism and values-based leadership. Now we do have a caveat about Tom, although he is currently working at Whole Foods and has been very deeply in their culture. He's not speaking from the perspective of Whole Foods tonight. He's speaking from the perspective of a conscious capitalist, a member of our board, and a speaker who was recently in Germany speaking at the Conscious Capitalism International Conference there just a couple of months ago. So welcome, Tom. We're so glad you're here. Oh, thank you so much, Johanna, and what a joy to join Blaine today in this conscious community. So uh, thank you so much for that uh, prescient uh, introduction. Excellent. Thank you. My pleasure. And so, Tom, let's ask you first if you could give us a quick overview of the four tenets of conscious capitalism, and then Blaine will turn to you to give us an overview of compassionate capitalism. 
Yeah, terrific. Uh, when we look at uh, Conscious Capitalism as published by uh, Raj Sisodia and John Mackey in the book, which I have here, the Conscious Capitalism book, for those of you who are interested in going right out and getting one of those, it's also available on Kindle, by the way, not that we're selling them today, but I just wanted to make sure you understand these are the references. Yep, and uh, I see Eric is showing us a Conscious Capitalism book as well, the field guide. Um, so, uh, really, what John and Raj did was they codified a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about in the development field and the consciousness field, frankly, over the last 30, 40 years, and frankly, literally over the last hundreds of years. Um, but he, they codified these down to four tenets. And so we represent four tenets that pretty much the whole philosophy of conscious capitalism is contained within those four tenets. And they are simply this, higher purpose. And I would tell you to me, that's the one that starts everything and it per permeates them all. Um, and when we talk about a higher purpose, what we mean is that there's a purpose beyond making money for the business. Yes, we do need to make that money to meet that higher purpose, but there's a purpose beyond that. And what is that? And then of course, stakeholder integration and also known as stakeholder orientation. Um, in a conscious capitalism community, we mean a little bit more than just win-win. We really mean win-win-win-win all the way around and full integration. And we'll talk a little bit more about that today in the webinar. Uh, then, of course, our conscious leadership. We think that leaders uh, do something way beyond just to make money for the company. They really are charged with protecting the values of the company and without conscious leadership, there will not be a conscious community, which means we will not have that conscious culture, which in our community we represent with, uh, you know, Raj is very famous for, for penning a lot of acronyms and we'll get into that today, but there's a simple acronym that we use called tactile to describe our conscious culture, but it primarily isn't culture that you would expect is one of trust, empathy, loyalty, transparency, uh, fairness, egalitarianism, that kind of stuff. So that's our four tenets. Great. Thank you, Tom. And Blaine, tell us about the, the premise of compassionate capitalism. And you uh, do have a book. Uh, yes. Yeah. And I will slice this one up as well. Compassionate capitalism. Um, the tagline is really what the book is about, a journey to the soul of business. And I go into you know, my, my uh, co-author, David Meltzer. Um, we went into some detail just on what the soul of business is. And the, you know, partly what the book does is it takes the historical perspective of capitalism from when Adam Smith first wrote The Wealth of Nations, which was um, predicated on something that he had called the uh, invisible hands of commerce. And about 17 years before he wrote The Wealth of Nations, he wrote something called um, The Theory of Moral Sentiment. And the Theory of Moral Sentiment was the foundational grounding for the invisible hands of commerce. And the invisible hand concept had to do with enlightened self-interest. And you know, as we migrated forward uh, historically from the founding of the Wealth of Nations uh, concept, uh, and the economic model that it began to develop. Um, you know, right around uh, the late 1900s, the robber barons and, and whatnot started to, to show up. And, and I'm making some demarcations here. And then uh, uh, in the 50s, uh, Ayn Rand shows up, uh, Fountainhead, Atlas Shrugged. Um, and Milton Friedman comes along and he codifies a perspective on what corporations are supposed to be, and more precisely, what businesses are supposed to be organized around, which is profit as the uh, the Uber objective, which trans it moved from enlightened self-interest to rational self-interest. What's in it for me, you know, sort of a thing. So, compassionate capitalism is not so much a feeling structure as much as it is a behavioral prescription. How do we behave with compassion? that's in concert with and is aligned with this invisible hands notion. And the invisible hand is predicated on everything is connected. We live in a holistic, synergistic ecosystem. And what happens to one part of that ecosystem happens to other parts of the ecosystem. So when I'm treating something with compassion, I'm actually behaving as if what I'm doing out there has impact back on me. That's the enlightened self-interest piece. And it's organized, again, around the behavior that we engage in, not so much the feeling structure. I'm not, you know, it's not about singing kumbaya. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's actually, yeah, compassion in this sense has a very, uh, it's actually hard to do. 
and to make decisions that are compassionately oriented. Um, and for me, and we'll talk about this a little bit later, uh, and I've had conversations with both John and, and Raj about this, uh, you know, compassion is the, uh, the, the behavioral analog of consciousness, I think. Uh, that, that's kind of how I've, you know, if I was to put a thumbnail on it and say, here's the, here's the distinction, it's the behavioral analog of consciousness. It's one thing to be aware and conscious, it's another thing to look at, what do I do with that? How do I behave yeah, in that, uh, with that awareness? Yeah, I think that's such an important distinction, Blaine, because people, especially in the business arena, they hear the word compassionate and it feels all warm and fuzzy and kumbaya. But mm -hmm. what I'm hearing you say is that there's specific behaviors. Very much Can you so. give us one example of a, a behavior that would indicate compassion? Um, well, you know, you know, John and Raj uh, delineated four, uh, four, four pillars. We also had uh, four pillars uh, that we, uh, David and I developed. Um, you know, gratitude uh, is, is one. And I mean, that's actually the foundational piece. Yeah. yeah. Gratitude is a, um, it's not just being thankful for something. Gratitude, there's a supposition and there's, and there's a uh, presumption that I've, you know, what I'm tracking for, what I'm looking for has already arrived. It's impossible for me not to be grateful or it's impossible me, uh, more precisely, to be grateful for something that I don't have. I, I've got to have it in my mind, in my in my experience, in order to be grateful for it. So we use gratitude as a behavioral uh, north star. I guess would be one way to look at it. So gratitude comes into play. Uh, we also talk about empathy, and this is where the behavioral dynamic comes in. It's not sympathy; it's empathy. Um, Putting you know, literally putting myself in somebody else's shoes, you know, is, is the colloquial definition for it, and that's kind of what you know we organize around, yeah, in regards to that. Um, accountability, um, there's nobody out there but me. I mean, that's probably the, the philosophical way of looking at it, metaphysical way of looking at it. The, the world is a mirror for my internal consciousness, and the actions that I take uh, have impact and they come back on me. So, if, if things aren't working, it, it eliminates blame. Peter Drucker yeah, had his, or not Peter Drucker, I'm sorry. Um, uh, oh, my brain just went dead here. Um, the big award in uh, Japan, uh, the, the, the Deming Prize. Yeah, Edward Deming had, uh, I think, number 13 on his list of things that he uh, uh, had folks and organizations pay attention to was drive fear out of the organization. Fear is predicated on lack of connection. Fear is predicated on blame. Uh, being present or the avoidance of blame. So accountability is a behavior that's organized around everything that's going on out there is mine to own. How do I do that? And, and that's a, I mean, that's taken a big bite out of a very big elephant for a whole lot of folks. Yeah, it, it's all mine. <laughs> it's not yours, it's mine. 100% responsibility lies here. And the last piece had to do, the last pillar was effective communication. And I call it, you know, communication mastery. We called it effective communication in the book, but it really is about mastering the process of, ma uh, of managing meaning. That's what communication, you know, Virginia Satir said that communication is simply the ways we work out common meaning with one another. So, you know, throughout the, uh, the supply chain, throughout the value chain, meaning has to be consistently in place. Otherwise we go off the rails. So how do we go about doing that and, and, and making sure that we're getting what we say we'd like to have? Great. I love that, Blaine. I actually just yesterday wrote an article about, about all that the, from Adam Smith to the, the rise of conscious capitalism. Because um, I think that this is what he intended when he wrote The Wealth of Nations. Would you agree? I Absolutely. <clears throat> yeah. But then immediately there was all what, what we call crony capitalism that happened. <laughs> so how... And I'll, I'll switch to Tom for a second and then give you an opportunity to answer it as well. But how do you see conscious capitalism and then compassionate capitalism being the antidote for crony capitalism? And, and specifically, the challenges of, like, it's so deeply ingrained in the system. Like, how do, how do we create those levers? 
Mm. Yeah, and man, is that a very uh, broad-based and, and large concept, but let's deconstruct a few key pieces here of that. And a, a big one here is when we go back to those four tenets, we really look at this conscious leadership, keeping in mind that our conscious leaders, their real role is to protect those values of that company. Mm -hmm. And um, like you, I have posted many articles as well on this. In fact, I just posted one on in the retail industry because so many of the retailers lost sight of what their original mission has been. And what happens is they eventually transition into what we know in conscious capitalism is not conscious capitalism. And that's the top priority and that our higher purpose becomes either profit or just pure survival, which drives that that fear-driven energy. So the answer to it, of course, is how do we balance these four pillars, these four tenants, and then make sure that we're developing leaders who are able to represent and protect those values, meaning those resources, those choices, and those levers you're talking about will be in effect protected and actually utilized so that we begin to make better choices, so that we really do look at long-term goals, not short-term necessarily, right? Mm -hmm. And so those are just a few of the things that we look at. But if you have conscious leadership, you really are, I see my stakeholder and me as not only being equals, but the same, then I'm gonna make different choices than if I'm in this to try to win. I'm not in this to try to win. I'm in this for us to win, not for me to win, right? And so there are mechanisms that you use to protect that. And most of that is around conscious leadership and frankly, conscious culture that holds our leaders in check when we see them begin to stray. Mm -hmm. yeah. Now I've heard both of you say um, a version of I am you and you are me. <laughs> and <clears throat> I think that really hits to the the core of what we're talking about. But Blaine, I want to give you an opportunity to answer the, the same question. Yeah, um, you know, the, the, crony, the crony capitalism piece here, um, it, it, it's, I think as a consequence of, of getting away, and Tom, you were absolutely describing this, uh, we get away from the fundament, fundamental mission of what the business was founded on to begin with. And when the, the shift goes towards uh, the making of the money uh, as is kind of the, the 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 major focal point. Yeah, you know, cronyism comes into play because you know self interest, rational self interest. What's in it for me? What's in it for the small the small us that uh, I'm, I'm you know, most closely associated with? So that's a that's a human nature sort of a dynamic. Selfishness is part of just kind of the way you know we get ourselves wired. I think um, the leadership function is the answer to that and. Leadership, not from a command and control perspective. Um, but what the way that in the work that we do, the you know, the way I define leadership is it's the process of co-creating. Keyword here: co-creating coordinated movement in the system that gets the actions necessary to produce the results that we want. And if that co-created coordinated movement is organized around the mission, the delivery of the mission of the organization, then we have kind of a. Uh, uh, that's the word I'd use here. Yeah, we, we, we build in uh, governors in, into the system because people are continuously referencing um, that mission. There's, there's a point, I think, in every organization where they're, they're founded on a mission and the mission drives everything. That's the you know, passion is there. And, uh, so we develop a business to deliver on the mission uh, that the business was founded on. And if we're successful, you know, we start making the money and we start being you know, able to deliver really well and really good on our service or product promise. And then, you, and you'll hear this in the language in the organization, the, the conversation shifts from conversations about the mission and how are we doing with the mission to questions about and conversations about are we hitting our numbers? Yeah, our, yeah. And, and they become business conversations, not mission conversations. And it's a move from mission with a business as a delivery mechanism to business with a mission as an afterthought. And that's where the mission goes up on the board and it's, you know, it becomes artwork. Um, and, and it happens with every organization, which is why I think it's a cultural thing you know, that the leaders really need to attend to. Cronyism lives in a culture that allows for it to grow. And you know, one of the major roles and one of the major responsibilities for an effective leader is to attend to the growth and nurturing of an effective culture. So it's a long-winded answer, but that's kind of where, you know, 
where I see it moving and how I see cronyism uh, actually you know, beginning to appear. Yeah, I think it's it's like the the difference. It's from you know it's fear based, it's scarcity based versus abundance based or love based. We do have a question from the audience um, for Blaine. What do you see as the distinction between mission and purpose, and does that distinction matter if you do see one? I, I really don't see a huge distinction. It's more of a semantical dis uh, distinction. Um, it's, you know, ultimately at the end of the day, I mean, you know, Simon Sinek talks about the why, you know, why do we exist? That's kind of what we're, you know, wrestling with here. Why, yeah, yeah, there's a, a hundreds of thousands, well, not hundreds of thousands, but there's thousands of computer companies out there. Why do we exist? Why does, <clears throat> yeah, Apple is a trillion dollar company for a specific reason. I think they were really, really good at defining the why we exist that uh, differentiated them from Dell as an example or from Compaq. Um, and, uh, and Jobs, I mean, I'll, I'll talk about him in a little bit here, uh, when we talk about some leadership, but uh, he was, he was very adamant about keeping that why in front of us yeah. or in he front did. of the company. Yeah. yeah. And he did a fantastic job, which is why they're a trillion dollar company. Um, all right. So Blaine, in compassionate capitalism, you bring in the concept of spirituality in business, which we, we also have. In conscious capitalism, there's, um, we talk a little bit about spiritual intelligence, but I'm going to want Tom to expand on that. But I'm curious, um, can you explain what that means to you and how has that idea been received? You know, surprisingly, I'll, I'll address the second question first. Very well. I'm finding that there's a lot of receptivity. Um, I gave a lecture in Japan earlier this summer, uh, and the, the title of the talk, and we had about 400 people in the room, it was actually more than a talk, it was a, a, a mini workshop, uh, Business is a Spiritual Discipline. And, I mean, the, the standing ovation at the end, and the, which was really kind of interesting because it was all done through translation. So to have it, you know, be received as well as it seemed to have been received and you know, told me that I was on to something here. Um, so it's, I find it more and more uh, coming into people's consciousness as a viable way to actually work. Um, the way that I define spiritualism, you know, and again, I'm going to be very clear with this, it is not in a religious context at all. It is very much uh, associated with the tagline of the book, Compassionate Capitalism, A Journey to the Soul of Business. Carl Jung, the philosopher and psychologist, defined the soul as that part of anything that gives voice to wanting to be more. It cries out to grow. It cries out to seek more. To, to, you know, it's that life seeks expression. It, it seeks to be uh, greater than what it currently is. And in that sense, that growth is universal. And that's where the spirituality comes in. So when a, when a business is working in the context of both conscious and compassionate capitalism, it's fostering that need to grow. You know, the value proposition you know, would be, how do people feel about themselves when they're in the presence of your service or product? Do they feel enabled to be more? And if I'm doing that, I'm actually touching the spirit that informs life. And that's what I look for. Uh, so the, that's where the spirituality comes into play. And it's, it, it's in, in connection. Everything is connected in some way, shape, or form. So I'm taking care of it. That's the other part of this. I, you know, that's the compassionate part. I am taking care of that. I'm nurturing it. I'm looking for ways to, to enable it to grow and give voice to it. Thank you. I love that. The, the value proposition is in how do, how do we make people feel in the presence of our product or service? Yeah. Thank you. And Tom, oh, where do you see or how do you see this dovetailing the spirituality with conscious capitalism? Um, with the conscious capitalism community, you know, now that we have uh, Richard Barrett's voice in with the values, we look at, you know, the needs and the values that occur at different levels of consciousness. And the spiritual competencies are really all the ones that occur in those growth needs. Just as, as Blaine was saying, we see this very much the same as you. Uh, we just use a little bit of a different languaging. So we're saying the same message. It's like I'm speaking one language, you're speaking another, but we're saying the same thing here. And the way we look at this really is this 
this is in our growth needs. This is where the real engagement occurs because by meeting people's basic needs, what happens when you meet people's basic needs is they're, they're complacent, they're satisfied. Um, but what happens if you don't meet them, of course, is all this negative fear stuff we talk about. But once you meet people's basic needs, that's when transformation begins and you start moving then into those growth needs. And in the values community, and the way we look at this is that the three kind of areas here are really, what's the internal cohesion? This is all about our connectedness that Blaine talked about. And so it's like, what are all those values that we do in our both those behaviors that help us be internally cohesive together? And then of course, as we all are trying to do, we're trying to make a difference. That's about, again, our connectedness. We're all making a difference. Who are we making a difference for? It's not for ourselves. It's really for us as this collective group, right? And then of course comes what we would call that servant leadership. So, you know, in the 30, 40 years I've been doing this, I remember us talking about servant leadership 30, 40 years ago. And now we really do have, okay, what's that jump? Because I often hear people speak to this where they go, well, you got to get out there and you got to make it happen. You got to do this. And then all of a sudden, then boom, it's all got to be selfless. Well, what's that big path that's between that get out there and make it happen and then suddenly it's selfless? That isn't something that just happens like you flip on a switch. There's a lot that happens in there and that's this internal cohesion, making a difference. Your mission, as you just talked about, which is really how you go about reaching that higher purpose, right? And so that's, that's how we see it here. Very much those growth needs. Great, thank you, Tom. And we have another question from the audience. How do we crack the code? Who do we get to listen to concepts like empathy and consciousness and spirituality? in the business world. So this is, you know, as if we're consultants, like how do we get CEOs to listen to this conversation? <laughs> uh, yeah, I'll, I'll take a, a run at this because uh, those are the, <laughs> that is the cohort I, that I work with uh, as a consultant. Uh, Speaking their language, I think, is probably the easiest way to, yeah, and I don't mean it's easy to do, but speaking their language. Yeah, I grew up on a farm in Oregon, and we used to catch, you know, catch snakes when I was a kid. You know, I mean, don't ask me why. It was just something we did. Um, but the way you would catch a snake is you would, you know, dangle something shiny in front of it and get it to focus on it, and then you'd come up behind it and grab it, and you'd catch your snake. That's kind of what this is about is you get the shiny thing in front of them and they start paying attention to it. And then while they're doing that and, and you're actually delivering on that shiny thing, you're bringing in this other stuff and it's reality lives in um, conversation. And I think what happens if, if I'm doing my, if I'm doing my work well, I'm changing the conversation in the organization. And it, and it begins with internal conversation first, and then it begins to show up in external conversation. And you know, reality reflects uh, conversation, and conversation creates reality. So there's this kind of a push me, pull me sort of a dynamic in play here. But um, the, the short version of it is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a snake handler. <laughs> so, so sort of follow on question, and it's a two part question. What are the shiny objects that you're seeing are catching attention now and has that changed since you began your consultancy because you've been around the block a few years uh, yeah yeah i have uh employee engagement is a big one right now uh how do we keep our people really engaged and um i mean and there's a whole number of demographic you know, data that i could jump into that i'm not going to but yeah and, yeah how do we keep our people plugged into what we're trying to do and, and what we, you know, what we say is important. How do I, from a leadership perspective, how do I get people to do what I need them to do that they don't want to do? <laughs> it's kind of like, yeah, the, the $64,000 question. And that statement alone dates me. But um, I, I, so, I got know, it. Yeah, employee engagement. ROI is always a part of the mix in some way, shape, or form. So, uh, yeah, what's, you know, if I'm going to pay for this, what am I, you know, what am I going to get out of it? Um, those are the two fundamental ones that I think come into play here. And then we get into some of the uh, more um, subjective ones about, you know, teams working better, you know, more effective together, uh, we, you know, reduction in cycle time. I mean, there's a number of metrics that we could start coming into play. Um, you know, interestingly, and, and Tom, I want to hear your you know, comments on this as well. But yeah, I'm on the board of, uh, and you mentioned this in your introduction, Johanna, uh, the World Business Academy. And we were, uh, kind of catalytic in the beginning of the just capital movement. 
And, you know, the idea there was if we're going to change how business is running, we need to change the metrics that business is attending to. So in, you know, in answer to the question, you know, what are people you know, paying attention to? What's the bright, shiny object? The more the just capital parameters, you know, begin to take root, I think you're going to begin to see uh, different focus areas coming into play and different values coming into play relative to what we're trying to make happen. Great, thank you. And Tom, what do you have to add to that? Wow, so many things there that are wonderful, but I'm gonna pick one or two that I think really there's a couple of things. Yes to everything you said, as we continue to do, we're singing the same song here, but a different language. Um, one of the things I really like, you know, that you talked about, and this is one of the things Richard Barrett does with the values work. He says a transformation occurs through dialogue. And this is one of the things in the work that I do with them that I said, I don't think people really, they underestimate how powerful that is. And if you think about it in all spiritual communities, the transformation doesn't occur necessarily sitting in a cave. It occurs when you're out, you know, any spiritual path says it doesn't happen in the temple. It happens out on the street. And it's that dialogue. Yes. And so that's really important. And that is one of those things. But I wanted to come back to the shiny object because you did mention all the really great ones that we talk about. But there's one that we talk about in the values community. And we were hitting on it toward the end there. And that's why I wanted to build on this, that we really look at that the real shiny object here is the transformation of that leader. And if we can work on that leader to have that leader transform, then the organization transforms because we know that organizations don't transform, leaders transform. And if we can focus on that, and then this real shiny object is the transformation the leader gets to experience. Once we can get them there, but you know we got to go through all those things Blaine said earlier to just open the door. And so this is really great. And what, you know, what a great way to help people see this stuff in action. That's how it works. Great, thanks Tom. Um, is it okay if I go off topic just a little bit because something happened yesterday or maybe Monday at this point that I was pretty excited about. Did y'all see the World Economic Forum put out the Davos Manifesto for 2020 and they followed the executive roundtable in or the business roundtable in saying the purpose of business is not just to generate profit. The purpose of business is to care for all stakeholders. So um, Tom, you have the mic first. What what do you think about that? <laughs> well, I couldn't be happier. And I did, I read your blog, your post, which was terrific <laughs> and really helped highlight that. Um, yes, this is at the heart of stakeholder orientation. We really begin to see. And then one of the other things Blaine mentioned earlier, which I think is really important. Uh, we also know in the OD, organization development field, that what we measure is what we can change. And so if we're not measuring these other things other than shareholder value or pure profit, then we're not going to change them. Because first of all, we're not going to have a consensus as to what really is happening in this situation. Right. So once we begin to actually measure some of these other things, and that's what Davos is getting behind. How do we start to look at now the quality of life issues? How do we start looking at in terms of long term sustainability issues and measuring those and providing a consensus platform for us now to look at what is the real value? Right. I, I think if many of us remember about 20 years ago, there was this book written, you know, the real cost of that cheap pickle you know, jar that you got. And that really was a first stab 20, 30 years ago, beginning to open up this conversation of what is value, the value proposition here that we're talking about. And I think that's what we're hitting at. Yeah. Uh, I, boy, I couldn't agree with you more, Tom. Uh, the, um, the, the purpose of, and I'm going to go all the way back to the theory of moral sentiment here in, in one sense. I think that the purpose of business, and this is evident in you know, the, the Roundtable uh, Manifesto and the Davos uh, piece, the purpose of business ultimately is to uplift the experience of being alive on this planet. That's the purpose of business, is to uplift the quality, uplift the experience of being alive on this planet. And not just for human beings, it, it's for everything. You know, everything is connected. I wanna uplift the quality of life for a tree, uh, as an example, or a mollusk that's having its shell um, beginning to dissolve because there's too much CO2 in the, uh, the water. Yeah, business takes that on. And, and at the World Business Academy, the uh, 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 tagline you know, for the academy is business taking responsibility for the whole. 
Yeah, and business is the most pervasive force on the planet today. I mean, there is literally nothing that is not touched by the activity of business in some way, shape, or form. And as a consequence of that, business does have the ability, and I think also the moral um, uh, need to take that responsibility. And this is where compassion comes in again, to care for the, yeah, the ecosphere in the way that uh, it, it needs right now, quite frankly. Uh, you know, there's, there's six, I think, six major tipping points uh, that are being paid attention to right now, and every one of them are uh, ready to flip over. And that's not cool. <laughs> right. Not at all. So we have another uh, question. So our, our friend Eric is an adjunct professor, and his focus is to awaken and enable a conscious workforce. So as, as a demand pull approach, um, and so his question was based on your comments about leadership. Am I barking up the wrong tree? I'm going to interject and say, I don't think so. I think it's a both and. But what do you think, oh, Lane? Yeah, you did restate the, the question again. So his focus is to awaken and enable a conscious workforce, basically so that the young kids coming out of college are demanding purpose-driven companies. Um, so do you think that's a good approach or is it, do you think he's barking up the wrong tree? Oh, no, I, I mean, that. boy, feed the dog, feed the dog. Uh, absolutely. Uh, yeah, I, I mean, I came up in the 60s uh, and I was, you know, I was a rabid crusader rabbit. I mean, I was, you know, I was passionate about all, and, I, and the kids today, and I say the kids today, folks that are entering the workforce today, uh, and po folks that are in the management ranks today, um, remind me of me in a lot of ways. They had the passion and drive, you know, the altruism. Um, you know, Oscar Wilde talked about, um, in one of his plays, about the striving for utopias. And without the, uh, the striving for utopias, no, nothing has ever been uh, you know, truly achieved. And when we stop striving for utopia, we may as well just give up the, uh, you know, the ghost. Um, I think that you're barking up the right tree. And you know, how leaders today, and, and I'll go pick up on what Tom said a little bit ago, how, how we develop leaders today to make that happen, uh, to, to invite that kind of dialogue. And I, in the dialogue, I think is crucial here. Far too often in organizations, we, we have discussions about everything. And I'll go down a rabbit hole real quick here. You know, the word discussion has the same root as the word concussion and the word percussion. And, you know, obviously a concussion is what happens after you've been struck and a percussion is the sound that's made when something's been struck. A discussion in most organizations is me throwing my point of view at you as hard as I can and you throwing yours at me as hard as you can, and the purpose is to win. Um, a dialogue is completely different than that. It's about an exploration of ideas, dialogos. Let's, you know, let's kind of uncover this. And that's leaders that can do that. I mean, Tom Chapman does this. Uh, uh, I, I think John does this, John Mackey. I, I know Raj does. Raj, I, I love having conversations with Raj. Um, I mean, there, there are leaders that do this and do it really well. And the consequence of that is people feel uplifted. And when they feel uplifted, the soul has been touched, the spirit has been accessed, and imagination then begins to percolate. Imagination, I think, lives at the threshold of the soul. It really does. You know, when the, when the imagination is engaged, spirit is moving. Yeah. And that's where real, real things begin to happen if, if you're allowed to you know, let, you know, give, give people their head and let them run with it. That's great. Thank you, Blaine. Tom, do you, what do you have to add to this? Terrific. Just a couple of quick things. Yes, di dialogue is not only you know, ne uh, necessary. I, from my perspective, I really feel it's required, must occur uh, for transformation to occur. And then, of course, when we talk about leadership here, we're not talking about just the people on the, the org charts that are leaders. We're talking about everyone is a leader at some point. Mm -hmm. um, and we know those of us who work with team building that leadership is a role. And so it's always changing. It's always based on the situation that different leaders emerge for different things. So we all are leaders in one way or another. Uh, we're, 
from the very beginning, even as youngsters, we're leading ourselves. Once we reach, get consciousness, we're really leading ourselves and making choices. And then we start to lead others and lead leaders. And that's where we start to look then at that scope getting wider. But with that, the whole reason I bring that up is because one of the core things I spoke about in Berlin was that the real transformation doesn't occur outside of you. It's one that occurs within you and that there can be no organizational transformation if there is no personal transformation. So that is what I think our, you know, our, our participant here is asking about. And I would say that demand pull kind of approach is really that call now to leadership is beyond just moving up the org chart. It's where, how do you, as in the 80s, we had these, these posters that said bloom where you're planted how do you now grow from where you are because each of us are going to be a different place on that journey and then just to finish this up we really look at the all leadership ultimately is about this journey from I to we. Where are you on that journey? You know, some of us are, you know, in that we journey and we're up at that servant leadership. That's great. But there's that big gap we talked about between that hero's journey and then suddenly that servant leader. And so what's in between that is those personal transformations we all go through. This is why we want to focus on helping the leaders have that transformation. And that doesn't mean just the org chart. That means each individual in the company. Great. Thank you, Tom. Blaine, um, I'd like to hear from your perspective how you think conscious capitalism integrates compassionate capitalism. And then, Tom, I'm going to ask you how you think compassionate capitalism integrates conscious capitalism. Uh, well, I'll go back to some of my opening remarks here. I think conscious capitalism, by, I mean, and this is such a, a, a simplistic way of, of framing it, but, you know, first and foremost, you know, consciousness is about awareness. And the, the power of awareness is it increases the choices that I see visible about how I can do things. And without awareness, I'm limited in choices. So one of them, I think one of the major, major strengths of conscious capitalism is that it is continuously opening up possibilities. You know, possibilities for doing business in a different way than what we have traditionally found ourselves doing. So um, that, that's the piece of it. Then, and then I go back to, you know, how do we behave as a consequence of a recognition of those choices? And behaving you know, from, the, from the perspective that everything is connected. There's nothing out there except me. Uh, no one out there except me. Uh, so I need to be compassionate in the way I approach that, which includes my growth as well. I mean, yeah, gr people like to be comfortable. How, do I, how, do I, how am I compassionate about discomfort, about consciously, consciously moving myself into an area of unknown where it's uncomfortable, there are no guarantees, and... Um, I've, you know, I've got shareholders screaming in my ear um, because they're not getting the return that they want. I mean, I've got, you know, Tim Cook's a great example of this when they, Apple started doing a lot of investing in green. Um, and shareholders are going, why are you doing this? It's, you know, well, if you don't like it, don't invest with us because it's the right thing for us to do. Compassion requires courage. Consciousness requires courage because it requires um, examining the paradigm that I think is, is accurate. I want to be able to you know, step back and really have a different perspective. What am I missing here? Great, thank you. And Tom. Wow, it's so exciting and so honored to be able to talk with Blaine about this stuff because we do share so many of the same things here, which is awesome. Um, you know, conscious capitalism completely embraces this compassionate capitalism. Um, and again, primarily, I would say those, at those spiritual levels, those growth needs levels. But that said, we talked about two concepts that really get behind this. That one is that this journey from I to we. So that where are we in that journey? And if I'm in that we journey, I don't just put myself in your shoes. I see myself as literally you and I are in the same set of shoes, right? We are one together here. And so I act very differently when I don't just see myself in your shoes. I see myself as yourself. And so what I have done in this, in this the values-based community, when I talk about compassion with people and they ask me this question about compassion, I say, can you think of anything more compassionate than me seeing myself as you? If I see myself doing something that's harming you, I don't see myself as harming you. I see myself as harming myself. That's the heart of compassion. 
right? You can't, of course, again, that's aspirational. We're humans. So we're somewhere in that I to we journey always. But we have great moments, each and every one of us, even, you know, the be people beginning their journey have insights and moments of full integration, which is just terrific. So that's sort of where we, we come down on this. Great. Thank you. Um, I want to open it up for audience questions, if we have any questions. Um, and then I think, because I, I just have one more question for the two of you, but I'd like to pause and see if there's anything that the audience is burning to know. And I'll, I'll ask the question to, to cue it up. Uh, so when, when will the audio version of Compassionate Capitalism be available, Blaine? <laughs> <laughs> that is a great question. I was talking to my publisher today about that. Uh, I would like to see it uh, by the middle of this month. Great. Yeah, we, yeah, we have got uh, the talent lined up and uh, I was going to record it myself, but I don't think that's going to happen. I uh, think I've got somebody that's got a better voice. <laughs> great. All right. The only other question that I had that we had talked about, I do kind of feel like you've both answered, but... Um, Based on our pre-call conversation, um, and maybe something else arose tonight, but what are the most compelling elements of conscious capitalism to you, Blaine? And then Tom, I'll ask you the most compelling elements of compassionate capitalism. Anything that you haven't, I mean, I feel like we've, we've really addressed the fact that, that we are talking about the same thing, just using slightly different language. Yeah. But is there anything else? And, Here's actually, here's another question. This is better than the one I just asked. <laughs> um, and this is for you, Blaine, specifically. Um, first, could you share a story of a CEO or business leader who was on the fence about this topic, topic but then had the transformation? Yeah. Um, let me, I'll, I'll change some names and, and whatnot to protect the innocent here. But um, working with a group in Australia right now, and um, it's a manufacturing firm. And the language, the, the conversation initially, and I've been working with them now for almost two years. Um, and it's in, it ended up being a culture change project. Uh, that's not necessarily how it started out, but that's where we might, you know, this bright, shiny thing. They wanted something and now this is what, the, what they're getting and they love what they're getting. Um, but the leadership group, you know, their language around the blue collar workforce was all these guys want to do is show up and get a paycheck. There is no innovation. Um, you know, there were a lot of assumptions in place about what they would not ever be able to get them to do. They're unionized. And so, I mean, you, you can imagine that, that whole linguistic you know, conversation. Um, and a lot of blame. You know, we can't get it done because they, you know, a lot of, you know, that sort of stuff. In the last, and this, this started to occur within about you know, 11 or 12 months. Um, and all I did with them was work on their consciousness. I mean, and I mean that very literally. Uh, we, you know, how you think about something is, you know, gets itself manifested out there in the real world. So every time they had this conversation going on, I had them begin to look at what are the assumptions that you're making and where are you seeing those assumptions being borne out? And at first they looked at me like I was kind of crazy. And I said, no, let's just kind of play with this for a little bit. And there was a couple of folks that were, and, and this was the senior team, there were a couple of folks that were very receptive to this idea. Um, and so that was kind of the seed in the, in, the, uh, in the potting soil, so to speak. And they started voicing things in a different way. And when they were hearing things in the organization that were legacy, they would correct it. And I gave them some tools around this. Um, and, and part of it had to do with the uh, linguistic distinctions between I, me, mine, we, our, us, that sort of thing. They, them, theirs. And the invitation was when you're talking about them, you know, meaning the workforce, think about it in terms of that part of me, that part of us. Yeah. And it, it's a stilted language. It's an awkward way of thinking about it, but it was enough to interrupt the pattern. And this was the key on this. We behave in patterned ways. And so what we were looking to do was interrupt the pattern. 
And when they begin to pause for just a moment, whenever you interrupt a pattern, you, can you, know, you have the opportunity to interject something new. And if the pattern interrupt holds, and if something new is attractive enough, it can begin to take root. And so I mean, it's a kind of a long story on this, but the, where they're at right now is they are more profitable than they've ever been before. They've got, you know, they are now actually being looked at as a model in what was considered to be a dying industry sector. Yeah, in the country, uh, a major shift, a major turnaround, and and these guys are just excited as hell. They really are, and they and they. I'm flying out there in January, and they are moving to literally being a purpose-driven organization. That is their entire mission right now. How can we take our purpose, both internally and externally, and have it be who we are? I mean, and, and I, I get chills just just thinking about. It. I, I love these guys. I really do. They they're just really ex <laughs> they're good to work with. <laughs> that makes my heart sing. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. And that's and I love that it's a manufacturing company. I mean, Bob Chapman has shown time and time again that it you know this isn't just for smarty pants. He's done yeah. this with dozens and dozens of blue collar companies. So yeah, yeah. And I said Tom Chapman. I met Bob Chapman you know, earlier. Yep. In the conversation. Oh, I heard I heard Bob Chapman. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, um, so Tom, have you have you seen this either um, in a former? I know we're not speaking about Whole Foods tonight from the perspective of Whole Foods, but you've worked at other big companies or with any leaders that you've done the values work with. And actually, I have, but I really want to just kind of even personalize this here. I would tell you, did you notice how Blaine lit up when he talked about this? Um, because this is why we do this work. We have seen this happen over and over and over at not just the CEO level, but every level. This idea that the, the leaders transform, um, and that's what makes the difference. Whether they're CEOs or whether they're a department manager or just so many new assistant managers stepping in. But here's what I would say, and I'm not really talking for Whole Foods tonight, but I would refer people to conscious capitalism and John's story um, about Whole Foods and how that occurred. John didn't start Whole Foods with a blue plan. You know, this blue plan evolved. And one of the core things that really made John who he was, was this exact dynamic we're talking right now. When the flood took out Whole Foods market, which John talks about in the book, we had a flood that took out one of the, the first versions of Whole Foods market that suddenly they were out of business. They were, had no money. They didn't have any product. They had nothing there. And then suddenly the customers came in and started helping John recover this business because they loved the business so much. Now, John didn't have a plan and start calling people, come in and help us. These people came in when John saw that, that transformed him, and that's what built Whole Foods, I would tell you, from my perspective. And he also articulates this in the book. So yes, there are plenty of great examples of this. Great, thank you. Oh, is any, all right, I'll ask Blaine you first. Did I, not, did we not touch on something that you think is absolutely essential and you, you, you're just burning to share? Ah, oh, boy, uh, open-ended questions like that. Uh, I'm going to go back to the one that you asked just before uh, we, we, we went down this, this track. Um, what, what captured my attention when Conscious Capitalism was published was something that had been just stating, and literally had been just stating in my, in my mind for a long time, but I didn't have necessarily the words for it. And when I saw the, the book come out, um, and then read John's story like you were just talking about, Tom. Uh, I was kind of like, oh, my, th there are people doing this. There are, and it's not just isolated areas. There are, I mean, it's, it was, I think it was proof of concept for me in a very specific way. Um, and I was, I was just jazzed. I really was. It was like, wow. And, and I bought a bunch of copies and gave it out to everybody and said, you got to read this. You know, <laughs> and here we go. And then I found ways to meet both Raj and uh, and, uh, and John, uh, and gotten to be good, you know good friends with you know with both of them, and just the 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 willingness to put that out there. So I think that's the big thing. It was proof of concept, not so much that this works, but proof of concept of somebody being willing to take that stand and articulate that um, in the face of what most people would think business as usual is supposed to be like, and. Yeah, I, I have nothing but admiration um, for, for what John has accomplished and you know, Bob Chapman as well. And I mean, we can just kind of go down the list. 
Um, but it was, it was for me a catalyst to start doing some other things. So uh, yeah, I'm, I'm grateful uh, that uh, conscious capitalism appeared in the way that it did. Great, thank you. I had the same experience, like, oh, proof of concept, there's other people doing this, it's not just my crazy idea. <laughs> Yay, where are those people? <laughs> Great. Tom, and any, any last thoughts that you are burning to share with us? Just, I want to summarize. First of all, I want to thank Blaine and, and everybody who's attending for being here. What a great conscious community we have doing this work. And then again, the challenge. We've been talking uh, today about a lot of ways that we do this work. I want to welcome people to this community. I want to also invite them and challenge them uh, because we've been talking off and on throughout this entire conversation about really what's underneath this, why we can't do this. And that is why we have such fear-driven energy. How do we deal with that? So without getting into too deep right now, I would tell you the best way we know to deal with fear in the culture is to deal with fear in ourselves. This is that idea that if we transform, the organization transforms, and the organization cannot transform if we don't. So I would invite people then to start to look as much as they can at these concepts we're talking about, and how do they begin to go to the root of fear, which is in each one of us. And when we can show up without that, we will indeed change the world. So let's go get them. I love Beautiful, that. Beautiful, Tom. And just, yeah, capstone on that particular piece. I, I love that piece, Tom. I really do. A good friend of mine wrote a book years ago, Jerry Jampolsky, uh, Fear is Letting Go of Love. Or, you know, yeah, fear is the absence of love. And this goes back to the whole notion of compassion and spirit. Yeah, I, you know, I connect with what do I love? What do I love? And when I'm connected to what I love, fear just disappears. It, it, it is, it's a non-issue because it drives me forward. And that's the spirit, that's the soul saying, yes! Yes, excellent. Blaine, how can folks get in touch with you or do you have a newsletter? What's your uh, website? Yep, um, blainebartlett.com uh, is the website. Um, that's my personal website. Um, and it'll link back to my company website as well. I've also got a podcast, The Soul of Business with Blaine Bartlett, uh, available in all the regular spots. Uh, got new episodes coming out every two weeks. Uh, so I've got some fascinating guests on there. Uh, so I invite people to subscribe and you know, just kind of pay attention. Great. Thank you. And Tom, how can folks get in touch with you? LinkedIn's the best format I know. And um, please come and join the network. And I will say just closing remarks. Thank you, Tom, for sharing. And thank you, Blaine, for coming and sharing your wisdom. Uh, this was such a beautiful, beautiful conversation that touched my soul deeply. So thank you. And I know we've got a lot of folks from our community, our CCBA community. If you liked what you heard and saw tonight, please bring a friend next time. And Send, them, send folks to our website. It's uh, ccbayarea.org. Um, we'd love to have you. So uh, thank you all very much for attending. And we've got two more minutes. So we can sneak one more question in if anybody has one. <laughs> I'm going to break into the Jeopardy theme song. <laughs> <laughs> well, while we're waiting for that, I want to just thank Tom and Johanna. Uh, I love this country. I love talking about this stuff. So thank you so much for the forum and for the invitation to participate. Uh, th this has just been a joy. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, it's, it's been amazing. Yeah. Great role modeling of that transformation occurs through dialogue. Thank you. I truly appreciate each and every one of us. Yes. And I really do believe that we are at a major tipping point. I, I think we're, we're all here on this call finally going to see Adam Smith's vision in the reality of how he first imagined it not the, how it was co-opted and sort of kidnapped by the, the feudal system and slave owners and all those folks who just wanted to grab it all for me. So, all right, everyone. Well, no more questions have come in. So thank you all for your time. It's been a pleasure. Um, yes, please, if you're not already a member, please consider joining us. You can find information in the chat or at our, um, at our website, ccbayarea.org uh, slash membership. 
So great to see all of you who are on video. Hi, Brett. <laughs> and have a great night, everyone. Take good Eric, care. Good to see you again, too. <laughs> all right. Signing off. We'll say bye for yeah. now. Bye. Bye for now, everybody. Great. Bye, guys. <laughs>